Hello, and you're very welcome to The Contact Book, a show like no other, because this is where our guests put their contact books and, of course, their trust in my hands. We look back at their life and times with a bit of help from those who know them best as we delve into their contact book to hear their life stories from all sides. It's enlightening and heartwarming, funny, and, of course, unpredictable. I'm Craig Doyle, and this is The Contact Book. So our guest today is our first ever Scott on the show. I'm delighted to say we have one on board now. And for many, the first name they think of when they talk about Scottish rugby, he has 70 caps to his name, getting his first one at the age of just 19. So, so young. He has won multiple English championships. He's won a European Cup and he is so brave. He actually took on his very own wife on Strictly Come Dancing. Perhaps, though, That's not what he's best known for when it comes to bravery of late, because in adulthood, he told the world that he could not read or write properly until he got into his 30s. And he's helped so many people en route, being so honest about that story. So to talk about his life and talk about rugby and everything that revolves around those things, a very, very warm welcome to Kenny Logan. Kenny, great to have you with us today. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. I'm slightly nervous, got to be honest. I've just got a little bit of nerves going, thinking who you're going to speak to, what they're going to say, but I'm really looking forward to it, really am. I've wanted to get my hands on your phone for years, years and years. <laughs> I know the Can I have it back? Contact. Nope. <laughs> Not till I'm done with you. Not till I'm done with you. Let's go back, shall we? Let's go back to your own childhood. Yeah. And look, it's, it's impossible to talk about your childhood without talking about your dyslexia, because it seemed to affect so much of your life, particularly your, your school days, undiagnosed, yeah. I guess, at that stage of your life. Uh, and it sounded like it made life very, very difficult for you, Kenny. What was it like back then? Life was really good at the start. As a six, seven-year-old kid, I was just normal. I was running around doing stuff. And then school got a bit more serious. You, know, you had to sit down and concentrate and write things down. And I realized quite quickly that I just couldn't do it and start to muck around and I get chucked out classes and then I'd do anything to get out of schoolwork. But I did turn up every day. I never ever tried not, you know, as we used to call it um, growing up, plug in school. I never plugged school, I always turned up. And I, I genuinely used to believe that one day it'll just, the lights will come on, it'll start to work. But it never happened. And, and even talking about it now, my stomach tends to tighten a little bit and that horrible feeling is that eight, nine-year-old child that's feeling really vulnerable and insecure and scared of what people are going to say about you or you can't do anything and ashamed. And, you know, when I was growing up, I never heard dyslexia. I never heard the word dyslexia, dyspraxic or ADHD. I just heard stupid, thick, or he's a farmer's son, he's just daft. And that's what I heard most of my life. And it was hard because you didn't feel that inside, but then you started to believe it. And you know, even as I say now, my stomach, I think maybe before I sort of started speaking about it, I couldn't, I wouldn't speak about it. I didn't speak about it. You know, a handful of my friends knew and some of them, my best mates never knew. They just thought that maybe they just thought I was a bit stupid or a bit daft, but it was a horrible feeling. And, and I I talk about it now because I don't want kids to feel like I, d- I did. You know, one of my biggest regrets is I wasn't brave enough. And it's quite emotional talking about it sometimes because I think as you get older, you definitely get more emotional, especially having children and hoping that your children don't have, you want to have some of the experience you've had, but you obviously don't want to have any of the bad ones. And when my son Ruben started to read to me, I just cried out. I was crying because I just didn't want him or Lois, to be honest, to have the feeling of missing that part of your life, which is, which is a really hard part. So when Ruben was reading to you, was it a, a regret that you weren't able to do that at his age? Is that why it was such an emotional moment for you? I just wanted him to be able to read himself, you know. And even when the kids were younger, I, I used to read the same book to them all the time because I just literally, I could, by that time I was starting to read a bit more, but I, I still struggled with certain letters and certain words because it, you know, I hadn't really taken that much in at school. But it's quite interesting when, when you start to read to them and then they put another book in front of you and I'm negotiating with a six-year-old to go, no, you don't want to read that book. You want to read this one because that's the one I could read. But and the more I read to them, the better I got anyway because I'd you know done a physical literacy program that helped me uh, later on in life. But I just wanted them to read to me, knowing that if they could read to me, that that means they would be able to do all the things that I couldn't do as a kid. And I knew that you know reading is something that you know my wife adores reading, loves reading, reads books till the sun's come. 
So, you know, in the morning she'd be picking a book up. She picks a book up all the time. And I just don't do that. I maybe listen to podcasts now. Or I do read, but I, I just don't enjoy it like I should do. I wish I could really enjoy it. It's just maybe a maybe it's your association. Enjoy. Maybe your association with it, maybe in your subconscious, you're like, kind of just gets you uptight. Yeah, I mean, it's still from somebody who couldn't read to somebody who now can sit down and read an email and, and respond to an email. And there's so many easy things to do now. If you struggle with a word, you can say it out loud or... It can read back to you. You know, I did send when I first, um, you know, when text came out, I was like, this will never take off. No chance. And of course it did take off. And um, one of my first texts to um, Gabby was, dear, and I meant to say, uh, speak to you later, sweetheart. It was sweat heat, it said. It said sweat heat, yeah, because the predicted text. And I looked at it thinking, yeah, that looks good. And I sent it. But I didn't really send many text messages at the start because I was, I just used to delete them or phone them up and, See, I never had them because, I was, again, I couldn't speak about them. It's a difficult thing to comprehend because we just take those yeah, things for it, granted. Do you know what? Even it, talking you know? to you now, I've got goose pimples going at the back of my head thinking okay. about I think as you get older, you get more emotional. And I certainly get more emotional about my childhood and going back to that period in my life because it, it was happy, but it was also sad and hard. When you're a kid, you look to, to one person to reach out to you and understand you. And, and quite often, and particularly from doing the contact list, we found that it's, it's a teacher and a PE yeah. teacher, certainly with, with sports people. And... I've heard you speak about Nori Berner. Nori Berner? Yeah, Nori Berner. Yeah, do you yeah, still have Nori's number? Yeah, do you still have, Nori, yeah, you still have Nori's number? I think you must have Nori's I do, number. Yeah. Really. Should we give, got Nori. Let's give, well, let's give Nori a buzz. Let's give Nori a buzz. Oh, and see God. If Nori I got a letter send. from Nori today. Amazing. He, he, has, he won't pick Hello? up. Hello, Nori. Uh, Craig Doyle's my name. I'm, I'm on the contact book here with your old pupil, Kenny Logan. Right. How are you? I'm very well yourself. I'm great, thanks. How are you, and, uh, Jenny? I'm very well, Nori. I just got your letter today, actually, the one you send me every year, which is very timely. All right, good, so, good. So, Nori, you write to Kenny every year, do you? Once a year, you send him a letter. Yeah, well, we, we meet up regularly, maybe once every 10 years, so it's, <laughs> uh, it's probably good to try and keep in touch on an annual basis. So I drop him a Christmas card, yeah. Nori, Kenny was describing the school days and how difficult it was. He was dyslexic. He didn't know what it was. He just knew it was hampering his education and his enjoyment of school. But you spotted something in it. Can you describe the Kenny you saw and the struggles he was going through back then? To be quite honest, I, I, I think it would be difficult for me to pinpoint the, the struggles he was, he was going through. I'm aware now that uh, he experienced a little bit of bullying. And uh, I, I think he himself puts that down to his dyslexia which, as you, you rightly say, wasn't diagnosed at that time. I mean, he came across, he would come bounding across to the PE department, but he probably saw as a, as a little bit of a sanctuary. You know, I mean, when he was at PE or playing any sport, he was releasing probably a lot of tension inside himself, you know, and he thoroughly enjoyed any kind of physical activity. It was like taking a spoonful of liver salts and dropping them into a, a, a glass of water. He, he had such a, a bubbly personality, and he, he was always so full of energy and enthusiasm. So for me to say he was having difficulties, I was probably totally unaware of them. He, he was great at PE, and he was, he was a, joy, a joy to teach. I hope you're taking this in, Kenny. <laughs> I'm taking it in, yeah. I'm very emotional about it. You, I was saying earlier how, going back to my childhood, it was is a very emotional period in my life but you know I can still see myself bounding across the playground to get to spend time with the PE department was it Mr Callum too was he had a yeah. PE member was it Mr Callum um, Duncan McCallum you, Duncan, Duncan McCallum. McCallum yeah I think spending time with you and you gave me that belief which I didn't get from the other side of the school because it, they just didn't understand me I suppose at that time at school and it's not the teacher's right. fault it just was one of these things well, I mean that's, that's I mean it's 40 years ago I mean things have changed dramatically since then. I mean, if you were at school now with dyslexia, you would have support. There would be learning support in place. And I think the unfortunate thing for you, Kenny, was that the qualities that you had, you know, the, the physical skills uh, you had and the softer skills to do with your personality, these are qualities that they were never measured back then. I think they take notice of them now. But in those days... I don't think they measure these qualities properly. And I think that's where your strengths lay, Kenny, in your personality and your physical abilities. You're describing a very difficult world for a child to comprehend, Nari and Kenny, because, Kenny, you had a teacher you overheard say, Asher, don't mind him, he's only stupid, he's only a farmer's son, not giving you any credit, mm -hmm. any, any hope with your education. On the other hand, you had the likes of Nori saying, this kid's got real talent. For a child to understand why one side of the school is giving you nothing, and the other side is giving you everything is very, it, 
It must have torn you apart. Yeah, when I heard that teacher say that, I was about 13, 14, and there was another teacher. She's about in her 80s or 90s now. You remember Deirdre Wilson, Nori, the history teacher? I she, yeah, yeah. she was the one that said to me I was dyslexic, and, and when I left school, I used to see her twice a week to learn to read a book with her because she said, we well, just keep doing it and keep doing it. And I used to read, uh, my first book was uh, Lassie, which maybe a seven-year-old could read. And it took me about a year to read it. After reading one page, I was exhausted. I just was exhausted. And I could read that page 10 times and st- I probably wouldn't realize I read it 10 times. Nori, you sound like you're ahead of your time, to be fair. I- I- I'm just wondering how you felt when Kenny was still only a kid, really, at 19, getting his first Scotland cap. I mean, you more than anyone must have been just so pleased for him. Oh, absolutely delighted. You know, if one person deserved it, I think it, it was Kenny. You know, he worked so hard for it. And he had a disappointment earlier in his career when he was under 15. 15 yeah. He didn't quite make the, the cut for the Scottish schools team then. And there was another boy in the, in the school who did, Gavin Carlin, who I think Kenny's yeah, still in mate. touch with. Gavin yeah, yeah, Gavin, yeah. And unfortunately, Gavin, I think he had a knee injury that forced him out of the game. But I think what happened when Kenny was under 15 was it just gave him the wee push. He's got that determination. When he wants something, he makes sure he, he works hard to get it. And that wee disappointment when he was under 15 gave him the wee boost to make sure he got into the, the under-19 team, I think it was, and then yeah. eventually his full cap. I think he was the, the first player for Stirling County. I'm not sure, yeah. Kenny, were you the yeah, first yeah. player for Stirling yeah. County to get I mean, a full cap? I, I often sometimes get annoyed, but people don't talk about Stirling County because that's where I started. And, you know, even when the game went professional, I was one of the last players to leave the club. And Stirling were a fantastic club. And, yeah, I was the first player from that club to get a Scotland cap and since then, I've had many, many, many players represent Scotland. So it was, yep. a, and it was just round the corner. You know, it was two miles from the farm. Great bunch, and it was a proper town rugby team, wasn't it? Not everybody knew who you were, and if you played well at the weekend, you got a pat in the back, and if you didn't, you were told very quickly across the street. <laughs> So it was, it was a great place yeah, to play absolutely. rugby. Thank you so much for talking to us, Nori. Really, really good speaking to you. And thanks. Uh, thanks no problem. For, take care of yourself, Nori. All cheers, Nori. Right. Cheers, um, cheers, guys. Bye. You're talking about Sterling there, right? And yeah. I know there's yeah. a guy called Robbie Mailer, who's an old <laughs> pal of yours. And I may have bumped into him with the outside grounds oh, before. God. You played with him in Sterling. I thought I deleted his number. You, you, well, you better not have. Let's, <laughs> let's get Robbie's number up and let's give Robbie a buzz. I love this because most people are most fearful of their I'm friends. Getting, I'm getting more nervous. My hands are starting to sweat <laughs> even more now. I thought I was getting the school teacher over and done with. Oh, I know. The, the school teacher's and best mates. He's never, the Robbie's ones. never in anyway. He never picks up. Oh, is he a oh. two ring? Oh, there he is. Oh. Hey, Robbie, it's, it's Craig Doyle here in the contact book. I got, I got Kenny alongside me. Hello. How are you? Are you too busy to talk, I'm Robbie? I'm good yourself. I'm good, sir. I was. I was. Robbie, on the contact book, the best mate has a huge responsibility to put the guest away. It's your opportunity. Anything you've wanted to offload for years. But it's interesting. We just had Nori's old school teacher on singing his praises. Yes. Singing Kenny's praises. So I need you to undo all that positivity. I'll try <laughs> what, my best. I'll try what's he my really best. like? What's Kenny really like? He is a great lad. He doesn't have a bad bone in his body. And what appealed to me was he was fairly mischievous. You know, as uh, when we were in our younger days, if there was a wee bit of scamming to be done, the bull Kenny would be quite up for that. And that <laughs> appealed to me. So I would prod him along. And because he was a thick farmer, he would <laughs> jump in with both welly boots, to be fair. You know, so I can recall one day where he thought he was getting the better of me and I was following him in his tractor in a trailer basically <laughs> full of shite and he thought he'd be smart and spray my car with the slurry so he opened up the tanker and it sprayed the whole of my car so mm. that was that was fine so we got to the farm but little did he know by the way his car was yellow the main <laughs> correct exactly it was brown when you were finished with it know. <laughs> well correct the shit exactly. car at the end exactly it was Totally brown. It was a shit car by the end of it. Exactly. <laughs> but little did he know he'd left the pump for the slurry tank on. Oh, so yeah. The main road right. that was going past oh. his farm was oh. basically a river of flooded. shit going all the way down. <laughs> it flooded the, oh. flooded the main road between Stirling and St Andrews with, uh, oh, I remember with that. slurry. So, but these were the oh. these were the kind of things that really tickled me. You know, I mean, that's that's what friends do to each other. You know, you you take it in one hand and get rid of it in the next hand. You get how rid much, of it the next hand. And how it, much? <laughs> how much did you enjoy Robbie his uh, his car, his very subtle 
sponsored car. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> that was his pride and joy. And I remember he picked me up on the first day he got it. So there it was, Kenny Logan, sponsored by a local businessman. He, like, he was one of the first Scottish rugby players to get a sponsored car. Me and Andy Nicholl, actually. Quite as well. Me and Andy Nicholl. And Doddy had one as well, I think. I think Doddy was, Doddy had was one, pretty... Yeah. yeah, so obviously, as soon as I got in it, I just kept peeping the horn, blasting the horn as loud as I could as we well, <laughs> were driving through the middle of Stirling. So he was like, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. And then, of course, he went through a phase because of the sponsored car that I'll not drink on a Saturday night. That's fine. You can drop me off at the pub and you can take me home. No, but you would you come mean, back. You know, Friday night or Thursday night, not Saturday night after the well, game. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you well somebody else would drive it possibly there, but you would come back and there would either be lipstick on the bonnet or <laughs> something, <laughs> something that was something similar to the slurry that he put all over. Something that was slurry that he put, oh, easy my, time, uh, easy. <laughs> mostly lipstick, bonnet, Robbie. Then, mostly, mostly lipstick. That was only once. Aye, uh, correct. Never and parked of course, it there again. The classic that he had his sponsored car, and this was pre Gabby, and he was obviously dating somebody else, and they were the golden couple of Scotland. And I remember being at the farm, and they said, uh, girlfriend at the time had asked for a shot of the sponsored car. So, yeah, yeah that's oh. fine. But then subsequently put in a hedge. <laughs> and, it, and it was um, it was wrecked, so it became mission impossible to try and get the sponsored car back to the oh. garage without anyone seeing it and the damage. We did it, it Robbie. Done. We did it. We did it. <laughs> correct, correct. It was. Um, Part it was for the very sponsor. For, remember the Sunday. sponsor phoned me up saying what happened, and I I'd correct. I see your car in the garage. Hit a tree. <laughs> Or I hit a hedge and he went, he was driving it. I was, <laughs> exactly. it, was, it was Robbie. He went, no, it wasn't. He. It was a girl. So I had to come clean with that. Yeah, you've got, got to know. Until now, know we, you've out. just told the world. <laughs> told yeah, the world. Correct. 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 I know. I know. Thanks so much for giving us a bit of dirt. Literally giving us a bit, a bit of nice dirt. Stuff, Robbie. Yeah, <laughs> correct. Enough. That's good exactly stuff. what it was. Thanks for joining us. Take care of yourself, Robbie. All the best. Really nice. No problem. All the best. Best of luck. Take care. Oh, brilliant. Bye. Cheers, brilliant. Bye. Brilliant. Bye. It was clear, Kenny, you were becoming quite the star. Look, no doubt about that. But to, to get your first Scotland cap at 19. So i guessing the coach, Scotland coach was Ian McGeekin. Sir, Ian McGeekin? Yeah, Geach was, uh, was around. Um, he was involved with the squad, in and out of the squad. But Richie Dixon and David Johnson, who were the two coaches at the time, who gave me my first cap in Australia. Because mm-hmm. Geach came in then afterwards, yeah. didn't but he? Geach was a big part of my rugby yeah. career, even... You know, he spoke to me when I moved to London. He always would come and speak to me, so he always gave me time, even when he wasn't coach. So he's somebody I've known for a long, long time and huge amount of respect for. Can we give Geach a buzz? Do you have his number? Give him an old buzz there. Yes, yeah, he's sorry, do have his number. He'll be busy today, though. He'll be out like, walking up on the hill. Yeah, well, he'll, he'll definitely be out. Hello? Geach, it's Craig here. How are you? i got Kenny Logan with me on the contact book. How are you? Hi, Craig. I'm good, thanks. Kenny does have a reputation, Geach, of being a bit of a talker, doesn't he? He does, yes. But great, really, in many respects, because you know exactly what he's thinking and what he wants to do or what he wants to look at, which, you know, when I was coaching him was actually great. I think the only time Kenny was quiet was the first year he got into the Scottish setup as a 19-year-old. Uh, and that's the only time, I think, since I've known Kenny that he was actually quiet. 19 is incredibly young, even in modern terms, in the modern game. 19 is incredibly young to get your first international cap, isn't it? Yes, I think we were lucky at the time with a few younger players coming through. Gregor Townsend, to name one, with Kenny. And we were looking at some of the younger ones because it was a, a change from the team that had won the Grand Slam and there were obviously going to be changes. And trying to bring players like Kenny in, who I'd watched playing for Stirling County um, against uh, the Edinburgh teams in particular, and get some of the younger players into the Scotland squad training programmes and then hopefully give them that experience, keep watching them and then gradually introduce them into the um, Scottish setup. So Kenny was, you know, recognised very early. I think he was, I mean, he was quick and he was keen. I mean, he was all over early, early days. I mean, Kenny was here, there and everywhere on the field. He just wanted to be involved. A farmer's son as well, Geach. He was a strong lad, I take it, was he? He was naturally fit as well. I think Kenny saw everything in actions and movement and obviously, you know, from school, 
uh, sport had become, in a way, the saviour for him and, and the really active part of what he was wanting to do. So along with the farm and rugby, he just had a, a complete and total involvement in it and a commitment to it. And he wanted to get better. That was the great thing. And the more you got to know him, obviously, the more he spoke. I can't get a word in edgeways these days with him, but then we could have a good conversation and, and actually, um, you know, just talk about the rugby and, and just how to keep moving his game on. And, and he was really keen, I mean, to keep improving, see what he could do. And, you know, from a coach's perspective, just very, very good to work with. He was a little bit showbiz as well, though, Geach, wasn't he? Oh, yes. And I think um, some of his early girlfriends had uh, natural talents in the media and showbiz world. And he get he picked up some very good friends, which also helped. But he was he is a natural performer in many respects. He's clever. He's astute. You know, he picks things up quickly. He has good ideas. I mean, he has some some fairly left field ones as well. But he's he is an ideas man. So he was always trying to put something on the table to try and do something. He's a natural, not just talk, but a way of talking to people that you just have a conversation, which, um, you know, is naturally so easy with Kenny. I should point out the reason he's been so quiet at the moment is that the battery's gone in his headphones. So we're able to talk about him without him hearing us. So you can say whatever you want. I still don't, I still don't think he's sorted that out. But I'm can just you hear me now? Oh, he's back. He's yeah, I've heard that. I was, I was just... <laughs> lo- lo- I've, I've been getting so much stick from my old mate Robbie, I thought I'd just say nothing and just listen to Geach speak because Geach used to always say to me, you need to listen, Kenny. And uh, it was a good tip. Kenny, Geach was saying you were a bit of a talker, though. Yeah, I think I used to just talk as much as I could just to try and hide the dyslexia stuff, you know. And I think one of my biggest regrets is I never was being honest. I wish I'd told Geach and I think Geach would have understood me more um, because some people didn't understand me, but Geach did get to know me well. And I, how many people can turn around and say, you've, you've worked with one of the best coaches in the world for 10, 15 years of your life. So we were lucky in Scotland to have people like Geach and Jim Telfer. And, and that, hence why that era was so good. You know, Geach would always talk to me and always give me time. And I was honoured as a young kid having Geach talk to me. So I was lucky in that sense. And I think that's why I talked too much. Just I was overexcited. Geach, did you have any idea Kenny was struggling to read and write? Yes, he did talk about about it a little bit and the thing I remember most is when we were talking about moves or doing things or where you might get off the blind side wing I used to run alongside you and we'd talk and have a, a sort of running commentary in the training session of the best time to, to move or where to go to or maybe try something in a slightly different way. Yeah, I remember those early days, Geach, you doing that. And, and the other thing I used to do, because I couldn't read the move sometimes, I would get somebody, I would pretend to stretch my leg and get somebody else to run the move. Then I'd watch them run the move, then I would go back into the move. And sometimes if people were injured, I was yeah. a bit confused because I, I didn't want to say, look, I've read the move, I don't, I don't know what it says. And, and Gregor used to get quite um, annoyed with me. <laughs> Funny, later on in my life, Keith said to me, Kenny now can read Gregor, and not many people can do that. But I, once I started to understand Gregor, God, it made my game a lot easier. <laughs> And it, probably made just sounds a, too. it just sounds exhausting, Kenny. All the it is exhausting all the time. I remember one training session, a lot of them. Uh, I used to go to the team room early, before everybody else. I would be in and out of the team room to see what Keach or Jim had been doing. So if there's a flip chart up, uh, there's pens and papers on everybody's chair. Um, right, how am I going to get out of this? And I once sat in the toilet for 10 minutes because I knew that if I was late, I wouldn't be asked to do anything or write anything down. So I was sitting in the toilet and I came in and Jim gave me a bit of a bollock and I sat behind a sort of post so they could see me but they couldn't see me. And I remember Jim and Geach and the coaches just saying he's late again, you know, he needs to be on time. I think it might have been Jim, he said, I don't know if he cares enough. And deep down in my heart, I thought, my God, if you knew how much I cared about this. I was there 10 minutes before everybody else, but I just couldn't, I wasn't brave enough to tell them. And when I did tell Geach about my dyslexia, probably it was 2001 or 99, I can't remember what it was. Geach and Jim went, why did you not tell us earlier? And it was just like, oh, because they just understood me even more. I wish I just told them and been brave enough. I just wasn't brave enough because of my feeling at school because I thought it'd be a weakness. And Jim and Geach would say, well, all right, well, let's get him out of the team. If he can't read, he's stupid. Or, you know, that was the stigma I had with it. Kenny, the journey, when you think about it, was fantastic because, you know, in those latter stages, the 2003 World Cup and those games, in the, by the time you were an experienced player, I mean, in the end, you know, you'd 
70 caps under your belt. And Craig, at that point, Kenny was standing up and giving presentations, talking about some of the moves or an aspect of the game in 2003. And I don't know if you remember, I mean, the last pool game in 2003 was against Fiji and we were struggling and Cow Cow was on the wing and scored two tries in the first half. And at half time, we tried to sort of look at how we could keep him out of the game. And one of the things we did was, Kenny, if you remember, we asked him to swap wings because I wanted Kenny opposite him. And the other thing we were going to do, we talked with Brian Redpath, was keeping the ball on Cow Cow's touchline so that he had Kenny opposite him and he was always the blindside winger because he wouldn't run 50 metres to get in the line. And Kenny sat on him all the second half. And from being you know, almost unstoppable in the first 40 minutes, he didn't do anything in the second 40 minutes. Kenny just sat on him. And that's the sort of thing you could do at half time. And that was the thing then with the experience, but also the confidence that uh, he did it. And we end up you know, Tom Smith scores with a couple of minutes to go and we're we're into a World Cup quarter final and just being able to have that conversation at half time. I remember that game because I remember you said to me it's probably the best second half you've ever had. I don't think I touched the ball. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, hmm, is that, is that a compliment? <laughs> Winger not touching the ball. <laughs> Geach, it's great. Look, it's great talking to you. I, I've been told that there's two dogs waiting for you to go for a walk and uh, you'll, be in, you'll be in trouble if you don't bring them. So look, we, we'll catch up with you soon and, and thanks so much for joining us. Brilliant. No, no, love to everybody, it's, it's Geach. Love pleasure. to family. And, uh, yeah, you, you too, Kenny. Cheers, Craig. Cheers. Okay, Kenny. I want to. I want to talk showbiz. I want to talk rugby showbiz. I want to talk yeah. the move to London. Mighty London Wasps. So yeah. many big characters in there. I mean, your club career was just about really, really explode. To do that, though, we need one of the greatest players of all time. <laughs> <laughs> we need one of the greatest club players of all time, perhaps the greatest yeah. wasp of all time, yeah. and certainly the best fella to go out for a night with oh. of all time. Oh. Let's ring Lawrence Delalio. The lol. Let's, get, let's get the lol on. Let's get the lol. So the lol was this captain gonna, of wasps. Was he yeah, captain he was of wasps when you moved over? Yeah, he was, yeah. Yeah, I actually met Lawrence when he was about 19. I played against him. It's the only time I beat England, actually. Under 19s. Probably off having a little lunch. He's probably having a sleep somewhere. You know, moving to Wasp was huge for me to leave Stirling and, you know, been been a farmer's boy all my life, but it was the best experience in my life. It was brilliant. Hey. Lol, it's Craig. How are you? Craig, how are you doing? I'm talking to someone you probably haven't spoken to in a long time. Kenny Logan's on the contact book this week, uh, Lol, and we just got into the Wasps chat and he was talking about that first big move to the big smoke. And seen the likes of you there. Do you remember the day Kenny arrived, the farmer's son? I do. Yeah, mate, you all right? Hi, Kenny. Yeah, very well. Um, he was never. He wasn't short of confidence, Kenny, which is probably why he joined the right club, to be honest with you. But uh, he reminded me very quickly. I mean, we played against each other, didn't we, when we were younger for England, Scotland, yeah. and uh, yeah, it was in your hometown of Stirling. Yeah, yeah and, and Scotland won, which, which obviously sure. Kenny reminded me of very quickly. I think you scored a try as well, Kenny. Actually, I can't. Yeah, um, I did. But. Uh, you know, so. uh, Anyway, he did come. He, he did take the brave move down to London, and, and you know, obviously, that was a big move in those days because uh, there wasn't that many players outside of their own country that would would, would be prepared to do that. And Kenny came down to the, the bright lights in the uh, you know of London. He came to Wasps. I don't know what he quite expected when he arrived, but uh, I'm sure it was slightly different to his uh, to, to his imagination. I mean. Um, he probably had a better rugby pitch at Sterling than he did at Wasps at the time. But uh, yeah. we, we had a lot of fun together. He, I remember it's, Kenny scored five tries on his debut, which I think is still probably, maybe Christian Wade might have, might have beaten that record recently. But uh, he certainly uh, certainly made a, made a huge impression, both on the pitch and, and off the pitch. And that was the start of a, of a wonderful time, wasn't it, Kenny? We had, you had a great career yeah. down in London. And, uh, and of course, uh, not just uh, on the pitch where you played brilliantly, but off the pitch... Uh, well, you met your, your, your now wife and, uh, and the rest of history, as I said. What was your memory of a Kenny when you arrived? Because, the, you know, it was, Wasp was a very, very special club and the likes of Lawrence, very special players, big personalities. Were you intimidated by it all? I never, I'll never forget, having, you know, I was getting touted around a couple of other clubs. But when I met the boys and, I, you know, and they'd gone through that um, whole sort of Dean Ryan and Rob Andrews leaving and Lawrence was then the captain. And Law would only been like 20. One twenty-two. I can't remember twenty-one, twenty-two. And you know, I'd obviously known Law since he was. I played against him, 
and you, you know, you, you had a night out there and you sort of, you know what rugby's like, you have a night out with somebody and you're his best mate. And I think I moved somewhere which didn't just make an impact on my rugby career, but made an impact on me as a person going forward. And because of the people that Was had, from the Alex King to Paul Volley to Joe Worsley, Gomersall, you know, Rob Henderson was there. And I'd gone into a club where... I wanted to be challenged and I, I didn't, it wasn't about the money, it was about the opportunity because there was other clubs saying you could go for more money, but it wasn't, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to go to a club and stay there for a long time. When I got to Wasps, I realised very quickly that this, this is a family and it's one of the best experiences I could ever talk about. Hey, Kenny, I do have to ask you about, um, I, I know what it's like to have a proper, to be delalioed, to have a proper mm-hmm. night out with the lol. Um, oh. Can you remember your first lol, your first being properly lolled? At once? Yeah, when, when I got my five tries, he, he said, right, we're out tonight. And uh, he said, it's tradition, if you score a try in your debut, you've got to have a tequila. So you've scored five, you have five tequilas. And then every, I think it was like every 20 minutes, somebody just came up with another shell for them. And they would, all the players were doing tequilas with me. I'm on the floor thinking, how are these guys still standing? And it wasn't until five years later they told me they were all in the water. And I had about 15 tequilas and I was totally flat. And Law was totally fine, you know. Yeah. Um, but we've had like, great nights out. And I think that, you know, we all know that, that rugby, you, you work hard on the pitch. And because well, we were winning, it was easy to go out. And, you know, if we lost, we didn't go out. So the motivation for us was to keep winning, keep going out, have a good crack, build a good team camaraderie and we did that and Law was right in the middle of it because you know, he was yeah, a great captain of course I was and also of course I was you know, <laughs> of course I was no, no. I, mean, right I like it Law not, not great captain right in the middle of it there's no doubt about oh yeah that. of I course mean, yeah. But, Sorry. I mean you know, know I like captain people think that you uh, you know that, that there, I mean there was a drinking culture in, across sport across lots of different sports at that time but we were still a team that were about about winning, about getting the right results. You know, if we ever yeah. if we ever felt that anything off the field impacted on what we were doing on the field, then we, you know we, we would have changed direction because um, the only way you go out and enjoy yourself is if you're winning and if you're competitive and guys are achieving their objectives. And I think that you know that, that's important. You know, <laughs> I wasn't one of these guys. That if we lost by two or three points, or we lost by you know 15, 20, 30, 40 points, as we all have done on occasions. You know, there's no going out celebrating that. By the way, you know, I mean, that's, no. <laughs> there's nothing to celebrate. So. You know, when it comes to delivering team tools, it's not a difficult one, is it really? If you want to go out and enjoy yourself and have some fun for the next couple of years, let's make sure we win most of the time. And, and uh, that's, what we, that's what we all try to do. I got to clear up something though, Lal, before you go. Kenny said that the lads would go out and they were all um, making him drink tequila and they were drinking water, pretending it was tequila. There's no way you were drinking water. No, no. I, was, I was as rough as old boots the next day as well myself. But I, mean, I would, I would, uh, I, I may have thought I was drinking water, but unfortunately I wasn't. But, uh, no, 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 no. I mean, the good news, the good news of coming out with me is I like to, I like to enjoy myself as well. So there's no, uh, there's no. Yeah, we know that. Up, no <laughs> there is no better man. There's no better man. Lal, great speaking to you. My pleasure. Yeah, listen, Cheers, mate. Great mate. Good speaking to you. Kenny, good to chat to you. Cheers, mate. Bye. You too, mate. Speak soon. Love to the family. Yeah. I love Lal. I just yeah, love him. He's, he's, a, a, he's, a, he's a really he's inspirational a great guy. guy. Yeah. yeah, he's a great guy. He was in front of his... He was before his time, you know, when he captained that team. I mean, some of his team talks were just brilliant. The way he could just lift the team up. He was also a brilliant lion. And, and Kenny, that's something you didn't get to, oh, to do. And yeah. I, I know this Similarly still hurts not. with you. Uh, I mean, I know this... It doesn't hurt. This... And it doesn't hurt. It just... You, you'd love to be in that place, you know. You'd love to be in, in that group. But you could have been. That's and, and that's why I want to bring in another old... An, a pal of yours and uh, oh, a teammate of yours as well with Scotland, uh, Brian Redpath. Oh, uh, let's, give, let's give the brush a call. <laughs> Brian, a brilliant, the brilliant brush. scrum half, of course, in, in the Premiership as well in England and, and, of course, for Scotland and for the British and Irish Lions. And um, I guess he probably thought he, he should He didn't play for the Lions, you know. Brush Hello? didn't play for the Lions either. Not, I always no. thought he did. Brian, it's Craig here. I, I got Kenny Logan with me. Hi, Doyle. How are you? I'm great, mate. You're on the contact book uh, and we're talking about Kenny's life and times. We're talking about the are Lions. You, oh, my God. I always presumed you were a lion brush. You not make the lions? No, ninety seven. Um, I was on standby and then hurt my knee, uh, my knee when Rob got injured as well, and Kieran Bracken went instead. And then two thousand and one, I was probably just missed out. And then two thousand and five, I was retired from international rugby. Anyway, that's it. You should have been no brush. You should have been. Oh, there's always should have been. What's the you know, end of the day? What's the was, lovely uh, tag to have? Some, you should have been. Yeah, some great players around them with Howley, Dawson, you know, Bracken, and then along came the youngsters. And, you know, it's just one of them things you miss out on, but no, definitely uh, can't regret in these things. 
Kenny should have should have been a line. Shouldn't he? he was good enough. Yeah, he was. I mean, um, I think the hard thing for Kenny was again there was there was players that were playing sometimes in informed teams, and I think playing at Wasps was always a really good thing for him. It's just one of these things. Chris Patterson's of the world, same, not a lion. So you know you have to get on with it, and if your time's not right at that time, but Kenny was definitely good enough to play. There is a reason, Kenny, that maybe you didn't make the Lions. And give us a little insight into how it all works. You got, like Brush, oh, you got yeah. that first call up to be to kind of the first meeting early on in the season. And then it was your, I guess it was your dyslexia that got in the way. T- tell us what happened. I remember we all, I think there was about 45 of us met in Birmingham or something like that. And you had to go there yeah, and fill all right. the forms in. And yeah. uh, I went to the toilet and didn't fill any form in. I couldn't fill it in. And um, I remember them counting all the forms in. And they would only get 44 forms because I didn't fill mine in. Not that that was the reason. If it was you know, good enough, I would have been on it. But um, I never filled the form in. I remember driving away. I never told MD. I just sort of put the form in the, in the bin, really, and just walked away. It was bizarre. St- I mean, stupid, really. Man. You know, getting back to what I said earlier in the programme, I wish I was more, I was braver. But those were the days that you had to play every week. So if you didn't play for your team, they wouldn't pick you. And um, Geach spoke to me and said, are you fit this week? I said, I'm struggling. I'm hopefully the following week, the week after. He goes, well, you need to be playing this week. And I couldn't play. So I had my back, I sore back and didn't play. And then they announced the team. And obviously I got myself going again. And then I was back in the Scotland squad to go to South Africa. And that's, you know, I look back. That's the one thing I look back and go, why did I do that? But um, not getting picked is not getting picked. What happened was I didn't go on the Scotland tour. I thought, I'm not going to go. Sort my back out. So I pulled out the Scotland tour and Tony Stanger went in instead of me. And within about a week of the, of him being pulled into the Scotland squad and going to the South Africa, he was pulled into the Alliance. So um, I, I'm glad for him, obviously. But um, for me, I was gutted at the time. But I'm also very lucky to be the, had the choice to play with great players and play for Wasps and, and, and also had some success with Scotland in 99 and, you know, played with Brush, who's a good mate of mine, and we retired together in 2003. So, you know, good, good memories, that's the main thing. And I, I never, I wouldn't have a regret. I just love to be part of that uh, squad, I suppose. Brush, we, we've spoken a, a bit about rugby and we're going we're gonna to move on from rugby in a minute. And the, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you because I wanted someone just to come on and just, just tell us all how good a player Kenny was in his day. Yeah, I mean, I think going back to the early years when we, we played, Kenny was playing at Stirling County and Stirling County were a good team and Kenny was always playing up a level, uh, two or three years older. And I think, you know, even when we had a, a really strong you know team at Melrose and playing against Kenny at Stirling, he was, for his age, he was extremely strong and powerful and, and he had no fear in, in, in terms of, you know, Kenny would back himself 100%. And I think the big thing for him was, you know, he, he was an out and out left winger and he was he was an exceptional left winger. You could give him that space and Kenny would have a go. He didn't lack confidence on the external vision of him. And, you know, he had he dabbled at goal kicking and stuff like that and playing at 15. But realistically, Kenny was great. Give him the ball as much as you can. And he, his percentages of what he did well were always higher. And I think that, that was the thing. You had to give him the ball, get him in the game. If he wasn't in the game... He was someone that would have a go from deep. If he felt it was right, he would support it. And I think, um, you know, from a young age, as I say, from the 18s, 19s, 21s at the time, you knew Kenny was going to be a, you know, a stalwart playing for Scotland, Sterling, and then obviously on to have a great career at Wasps. And, you know, underestimated because of the challenges that he had from many people. Fortunately, I was one of the closer ones to Kenny. And you saw some of the vulnerable times that he had when maybe a performance didn't go so well. And you saw that that side of him that was upset, but he had the knack of of brushing himself down and going out there and and you know improving people wrong, and he'd done that on many occasions. And it was a and he was he was a great player to play with, very loyal to the team as well. Certainly was brush. It's great talking to you. Thanks for that. Really, no, it was really you nice brush. Us. It's funny <laughs> having a mate saying things like that because normally it's the opposite, isn't it? You, you give yeah. each other a lot of stick and banter, but you know. Well, I think I we guess, we always do. I think Kenny and yeah. it's it's more of when you look back. There was a lot of good things that went on, and we were fortunate to play Grand Slams yeah. ninety five deciders against England ninety six ninety nine. You know, there was a lot of good things, and it was just you know we were we were always on you know just behind the, the good England teams and the very good Irish and French teams. But on our day, if we had everyone fully fit and uh, it was raining, we would have done it all night. Boys, I want, I want to finish up the Scotland chat with someone who can't join us live. But Bush, you can stay on and listen to this if you want to. But um, Kenny, it's a message from a very special teammate and friend of yours. Um, have a listen to this. Hello, Doddy Weir here. Very kindly been asked by Brian Disco to talk about Kenny Logan. What do people know about Kenny 
that he has not told you already. Kenny, I hope you got me in your favourites. You're in my favourites on my phone. Kenny and I have known each other for at least 30 years. There's never been a dull moment in that time, never been a quiet moment in that time. A couple of things is that when we went on tour, Kenny's nickname was always Amac, A-M-A-C. On one game in France, he nearly lost us the game because he was doing something that no kicker would do. Otherwise, Kenny, you've been a great friend, a great supporter, especially in my condition at the moment. I think it's brought us much closer together. And I'm pretty certain I would not be here without your generosity and support. You've got the most wonderful family, your wonderful friend, and I hope we can share many beers to come. Take care. Lots of love. The Dodge. The Dodge. Uh, I mean, should explain if you don't know, that's the great Doddy Weir, motor neuron disease, and is in a big fight at the moment, Kenny, the fight of his life. Great man. It's, a, it, it's um, emotional to hear him speak. Isn't yeah. It? I mean, Doddy's... I, I mean, brushes known Doddy longer than I have, but he's an un- unbelievable individual. Can't do enough for him, really. I think... Yeah. Yeah, it's just hard to. I think you, you need to speak first. I think struggling. Yeah, I mean, I think. I mean, if we go back to um, Kenny, remember when we met in London when he when it all came out that Friday before the England game, and and um, obviously we 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 knew prior to it getting announced to the public, and and we had to keep it quiet for quite a while. And you know, I had some great friends in in Hoggy and and Gaza Armstrong that were that were there for him at the first stage. But look, it was we see how how tough it is for many people that have got illnesses. Tom Smith. Robbie Burrow as well, and and you, you look at these lads and how they've got a fight and how we can support them and help them and the emotional times that are never going to go away and and you know we just have to keep fighting with it and and being there as I say I've known Doddy since he was twelve years probably eleven years of age and everyone's doing their their job you know Brush I'll let you go Brush thank you so much for joining us really good okay talking cheers to you. mate um, it's a pleasure simple. talking to you all take care. Kenny, you've done so much for, for Doddy in, in helping fundraise for him, you know, and I know how much he appreciates that. It is upsetting to, to hear that. I did hear Gabby coming in to comfort you there. I guess Gabby's sitting alongside you. Uh, Gabby, how are you? I'm well, thanks, Craig. How are you? Very good, yeah. And I, but I guess we're all emotional listening to Doddy because he's an incredible man and he's gone through such a tough time, a tough struggle for him. But, you know, you were there for Kenny when he was going through his tough struggles and some of the stories we're hearing today about his dyslexia and the way he tried to, to cover it up and... I was just saying to him how exhausting it must have been having to think ahead all the time. A situation might happen in a few minutes' time, a day's time. I've got to cover that. I mean, I cannot understand how he managed to go out and then put in amazing performances on a rugby pitch on top of all that stuff. It's impressive, but also very sad, Gabby, isn't it? It is sad. And to think that, you know, right even back to when he was a child, how much, you know, he would miss school because he would, you know, say he felt sick. But he did feel sick. You know, his stomach was kind of in pain and agony for the, from the experience of, of going to school and feeling no good and his self-esteem was low. And that makes me sad because I think that kind of never leaves you, does it? And, you know, you have to work through that as an adult and and then into his adult life as you say the the energy it takes to to be constantly thinking up plans and subterfuge and how to get out of situations you know he used to tell me about I'm sure he's told you about the meetings at Scotland meetings where he'd he'd always pretend to forget something so that he could be the last person in the room so by that point they'd allocated the job so he didn't have to write anything and all of those things um are you know are really sad because your energy should be going somewhere else namely playing for your country you know and uh, and it is you know is it's hard to to imagine that lots of other children were going through the same thing at that time now we are so much more aware and kids are diagnosed so much younger and have much more opportunity to enjoy school so you know one of the one of the great joys for Kenny is seeing how much our kids love going to school he kind of couldn't get his head around the joy that they have running into school and coming out of school feeling they've had a fantastic day and you know even though our son has mild dyslexia getting through school doing well having you know a crack at GCSEs and everything else that he didn't have the chance to. Gabby how did how did Kenny manage to hide it from you because the, the exhaustion trying to do that with your, your girlfriend someone you're in love with uh, I, I just can't I just can't get my head around it 
It didn't take long, actually, Craig. Uh, <laughs> after a couple of months, uh, the Daily, uh, it was a mirror, had written an article about me, a double page spread, which I was I was kind of a bit, um, didn't, I didn't love it, you know, and I read it, I read it and I said to him, what do you think of this? And I, I passed him the newspaper and I thought either he's the world's quickest reader um, <laughs> or he's, because he, his eyes kind of darted everywhere, all over the pages, you know, like he was like he was taking in words from, from every corner of the page. And I... I said, what do you think? And he went, yeah, yeah, it seems, you, you happy? You know, cause you, <laughs> do, you, do you think it was good? And um, I just looked at him and I said, are you dyslexic? And it was that, it was that. And, and he, nobody had ever done that to me. And he just looked absolutely, he looked like I'd just accused him of some kind of mortal sin or, I, you know, I'd, I'd found him kind of, you know, with a heroin habit. Or so. I mean, honestly, his face was just, he went kind of ashen and looked like he'd been discovered. And, and, he, and he said, yes, are you going to finish with me? And um, I said, like, what? Because I couldn't believe that that was something that he thought was going to be a, a, you know, a deal breaker. And it was obviously so... You must be gutted now. You're getting out <laughs> early doors. <laughs> but it was obviously something that he felt such shame about, which was the first thing that I felt that was so ridiculous to me that you'd feel shame. Because I, I grew up with a, a good girlfriend who had... Um, dyslexia and she ended up just getting more time in exams she went on to be a nurse and you know and to me it was just it wasn't anything at all to be ashamed of so that was the start of a journey really for both of us me understanding what it was like to live inside a dyslexic brain you know because it is very different and Kenny gave me some good reading materials and and Kenny then trying to work a way through it and is there a way that he can get to to kind of almost pick up his education again and work out how he could live a better and more fulfilling life you know with his dyslexia and also help other people. I mean, the fact that you're able to guide your own son is incredible. But there's another young man by the name of Jamie Bird. Actually, Gabby, stay on because it, this is your this is your old babysitter, right? And and no, Kenny, you... Jamie went to school with. Um, he was a bit older than Reuben and Lois, our children, and they all went to the same school in Kew, and we met through that school. So, Kenny, we've got Jamie on the line, and before we talk to Jamie, you spotted something in him that set off the alarm bells in you, and you thought, "I'm going to help this kid." What was it? So I'd, I'd gone through a physical lit literacy program that made a huge impact in my life. And Jamie's mum, Tanya, came to me and said, look, Jamie's really struggling at school and the school don't know what to do. And he's really losing self-esteem. And I said, well, look, I've done this program. It changed my life. Why do, why do you not try it? And Jamie started it. And then within three months, Jamie was getting a, a bit bored of it. And he sat down with me and I said, look, I'll mentor you. I'll speak to you. Anytime you're struggling, phone me up. And I said to him at the time, what, would you, what do you really, really want? He goes, I want an iPod. And I said to him, right, I'll buy you an iPod if you finish the program. And, I mean, he should tell the rest of the story because it's, it's phenomenal. I'm really proud of him. Um, I haven't seen him for a long time. I haven't seen him since his 18th birthday party. But he's a phenomenal young man. And, um, yeah, I suppose I'd like to hear how he is now. And I just, I just wanted to help him. I didn't want him to feel the pain I had. Hey, well, let Jamie pick up the story. Jamie... You've got the lure of an iPod and Kenny motivation you. What happened next? Yeah, so I always actually wondered what he would have said if I had asked for a Ferrari. But, um, <laughs> yeah, at that point in my life, I was in quite a difficult spot because I was being kind of moved out of normal school because uh, I couldn't read the problem sheets and I was struggling quite a bit. Uh, and Kenny kind of came into my life at that point and to have someone like him who's so recognized take the time to make an effort to help you really made a difference and I think it was definitely a turning point where I started to really try and kind of believe in myself focus on what I wanted and from that point I kind of think that it really did help me to just follow everything that I wanted to do and it ended up with me moving to a better school and then eventually actually getting into Oxford University so I really got where I wanted to be because of Kenny. <laughs> amazing, amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, that really is amazing. Jamie, it, it's a, you know, when Kenny was in school, he had a teacher who gave him a little boost and helps him along. And sometimes you need that in life. It sounds like, sounds like Kenny was your guy, Jamie. There are a couple of people in my life who I think have really had a big impact and got involved at such a critical time. And I mean, I was so young that having someone like Kenny come in and get involved with my life like that, really I do think made a big difference and I am so thankful to him because I don't know if I would be where I am today or have achieved as much as I could have done if he hadn't have got involved when he did. Hey Jamie, did you get the iPod? I did get the iPod, I love the iPod and I used it for many years. I mean thank you very much for the kind words but you had it in you to, you wanted to achieve something yourself and sometimes you just need people around you to give you that bit of support and you, I know your mum and dad have given you loads of support but you're a fantastic young man and I, I'm looking forward to seeing when you get your big job. You can maybe employ me to do something. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, thanks, Kenny. Jamie, your mum's on the line and Tanya. Hi, Tanya. Hi there. Hi. You would have watched this lovely uh, relationship and mentoring grow and grow. And you've obviously seen the fantastic results of it too. What's your, your whole read on this lovely story? Oh, well, look, you know, as a parent, you just want your children to be able to achieve their potential, but also more fundamental than that, the word that Kenny just mentioned was self-esteem. And, you know, when Jamie was that age in primary school, it's a really tricky time if, you know, you're being judged by what books you can read and how neat your writing is. And for Kenny to take the time to notice Jamie to encourage him you know I have three Jamie has two brothers they're all rugby players so for him to have Kenny take an interest and encourage him and support him and um, introduce him to um, a physical literacy program that could link up bits of his brain and help him so much was just transformational as Jamie said you know he doesn't think he'd be where he is today without that motivation support and you know so yeah thank you Kenny I'm so grateful yeah I mean I Thank you. I mean, I, I think I just you know one thing: if you can help somebody uh, achieve their goal, you've you've done something amazing. So well done to you both too, because you need the team, you know. And uh, the one thing that I always say that if you can leave school with self-esteem, you'll achieve your goal. But yeah. if you don't have self-esteem, you know, it's a big part of mm-hmm. you know, ch- children nowadays have got no self-esteem and really struggle. Mm-hmm. You know, he did it. You know, I remember he was so excited with his iPod. When I went to your 18th birthday party, I was blown away by that one because um, I didn't expect to be the, there were only three adult, four adults there. And I remember Gabby <laughs> saying to me, I think you should go to this. I think it's got an amazing story. And when um, Jamie said he's got 10 A stars or 8 A stars, I can't remember what it was, and I'm going to Oxford, I was totally blown away and I'm really, really proud of him. Well done, Jamie, and well done, Tanya, too. Thank you so much for joining us. Amazing. Thank you. Bye now. It's a lovely way to finish, Kenny. You know, when, when things happen in your life, you, you have a choice that you can let them get you down or you can use them to, to make a difference and change. And you've done that. And that story is a lovely way to finish because um, you've used all the negative aspects of your childhood to make positives in other people's lives. And I think that's really admirable. So, so fair play to you. It's important and it's good. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's been very emotional with Doddy and Jamie, but I just think, you know, Doddy's fight's amazing and he's a great individual. So thanks for getting them on because that really means a lot to me. There's a line from a newspaper article, Kenny, I want to finish with, and it says, that scared little boy that Kenny Logan once was has come a long way. He's been missing for 10 years. Thank God I'm making sure he never comes back. We like this version of you, Kenny. It's been really nice talking to you. Thanks to Gabby there alongside you. And, uh, Thanks for letting us into your contact book. It has been a wonderful experience. I hope you've enjoyed it too. Take care of yourself. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been brilliant. Great memories. Wow, that really was an emotional contact book. Incredible stories. Great contributors. Um, The show was produced by Keith Doyle, by Three Rock Productions for Audi. Please do check out all the other amazing contact book episodes. Brian O'Driscoll, Will Carling, Brian O'Banna, Maggie Alfonsi, Sean Fitzpatrick, to name but a few. Some of the biggest names in the world of rugby have literally handed over the, their contact books to me and we have delved in deep. So please do subscribe, share, tell your friends, do get involved, spread the world, and there'll be many more to come. Thank you so much. This has been The Contact Book. I've been Craig Doyle. Take care and bye-bye.